Indian Coalition, which is the uh, sponsoring organization along with the Society for Neuroscience of today's webinar. I want to thank you all for joining us on this webinar. Um, our purpose today is to give um, participants several different perspectives on the importance of animal research. Uh, we have a distinguished science, a scientist, a distinguished clinician in neurology, a policy professional, and a, a patient who happens also to be a physician in his own right, a cancer doctor. Uh, so it's a variety of very important perspectives on this crucially important topic. Uh, the purpose is to um, make sure that we all understand uh, the particular and valuable role of humane animal research in the development of therapies and cures. And our primary audience, um, we have several different kinds of people on this call, but the primary audience is people who are staff members of patient advocacy organizations like my own in Parkinson's, um, all of whom have a, obviously a very important central reason for understanding um, the importance of the research and how it is conducted. So I hope that you will leave this hour um, with uh, good suggestions to take back to your own organizations and acknowledging how animal research can be done in a way that's suitable for you and, uh, and will advance science. At the end of the webinar, I will refer you to resources that can help you uh, think about how you can incorporate this into your organization's materials um, and uh, well, uh, through the American Brain Coalition resources, uh, which will uh, remind you of at the end of the session. It's now my great pleasure to introduce, um, to kick off our session, um, uh, Dr. Mark Resnick. He's a neuroscientist at the University of Illinois in Chicago who also, I'm very proud to say in my ABC role, uh, Dr. Resnick is also currently serving as chair of the advocacy committee of the American Brain Coalition. And he will provide you uh, with a perspective as a researcher and also as a uh, prominent advocate for humane and properly regulated animal research. Dr. Resnick, it's a great uh, privilege to have you lead this panel. Thank you for joining us. He'll make his own presentation, and then he will introduce our other speakers as we proceed through the hour. Dr. Resnick. Thank you, Robin. Thank you uh, for inviting me, and, and uh, thank you to all who are listening. So as, as Robin indicated, I am, in addition to chairing the American the ABC Advocacy Committee, I am a neuroscientist, and as a neuroscientist uh, who studies the biology of neuro, of uh, neurotransmitter signaling, and, and um, in a more applied fashion, the biology of depression, I am a member of the Society for Neuroscience, which is one of the sponsoring organizations. And the Society for Neuroscience has, uh, I believe, about north of 40,000 members. And they range from neuroethologists who, would studying, uh, who study feeding behavior of, anem of anemones to neurosurgeons who might operate on your Aunt Emily. And if you go to the neuroscience meeting, there's an annual meeting each year, and, and uh, there are about 30,000 presentations. And those presentations are really quite, uh, quite remarkable, both in their breadth and their scope. And uh, walking down the, the uh, exhibition hall, one might see a, a poster describing the uh, the crystallography of two proteins uh, involved in neurotransmission uh, studies showing how those proteins juxtapose using using uh, rather uh, sophisticated chemical and physical methods, or one might see uh, a poster showing neurotransmitter action in humans using a, a positron emission tomography, using chemicals that might bind to to a neurotransmitter and and uh, emit, emit positrons so that one can see them in living humans. Well, those are pretty far apart. And you know what? Neither one of those uh, pro projects I spoke about used animals. But on the other hand, both of them use animals, OK? Because science builds on other science. So if a scientist does not use animals in their day-to-day -day experiments, and I frankly use cells more than I do animals, uh, they still use animals because as science is based on other science, we need to read the literature, and literature is often created using experiments that were done with animals. Okay. Now, having said that, why don't we talk a little bit about what we might learn from animal research? And that's really in the next slide. 
Okay, and and, and uh, what what we could learn from animals in research are a number of different things. As it says there, how does a healthy body work, and what are some of the mechanisms of disease? And both of those are are going to be very important. Now you notice the next one says that animals and humans are evolution. Oh no no not not next slide. Animals and humans are evolutionarily connected, and we'll talk about the similarity of genomes of mice and men in, 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 a, in another slide in a few moments. But the idea is that since it's more difficult to manipulate humans in the same way that we can animals, we can use animals to try and help us understand human disease. And, um, and finally, we, the, the fundamental research is going to lead to a greater understanding of the basic neurobiology and understanding basic neurobiology helps us to understand both the normal state and the disease state more effectively. Now, no single model is perfect. Okay, and we'll discuss a few models in a second, but the idea is that scientists use different models, basically trying to create a successful approximation so that we can we can understand best how a, a process takes place. So let's go to the next slide. And there we can see a model system, and this is the uh, Aplesia californica, and it is a, it, uh, actually in the earlier version of the slide it referred to it as beautiful. In fact, I think it's hideous, but uh, it's a big, it's a slug. Okay, it's a nudibranch mollusk, it means it doesn't have a shell, and it can be pretty big. At 12 to 15 are, are the ones that are often used for experiments, it can be twice as large as that. It has very large neurons and very simple behaviors, and when this animal is touched in a certain way, it withdraws a, a, uh, a, a, part, a, a, a part of it called a, a siphon. When that, and when that's done repeatedly, the animal eventually can, can learn not to respond to the stimulus. Well, that has been worked out. The cells are large. They were easy to follow. The pathways were, were, were clear. And uh, Eric Kandel, who won a Nobel Prize for this in, in the year 2000, basically used this, this sea slug to figure out the molecular basis of learning and memory. So this is an unlikely organism. One wouldn't think about much about aplesia. But the fact is that by using it and using some special features of the animal, including its very simple behavior and its very large neurons, one was a, we were able to dissect out the pathways of, of, of learning and memory. And, and that's very important. If we go to the, to the next slide, we can see rats and mice, okay? And these are really the, 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 the heavy lifters. Most of the experiments that, that neuroscientists and other scientists do are with rats and mice. Well, if we look at the, um, the, the genomes, uh, the, the uh, uh, rats are p between mice and humans. Humans have about uh, uh, 3.1 uh, versus 2.8 and 2.6 million uh, billion million million base pairs in terms of the genome. And there are a lot of, there, the genomes have been well identified. One of the things that we use mice for is because their genomes have been identified, we're able to manipulate those genomes. So that one can take a gene uh, and, and, and alter it and reintroduce it to the animal so that the animal has an altered behavior. One can knock out a gene and determine what the, effect, the effects are on behavior. So that mice have really been reinvigorated, and now we're beginning to be able to use rats in the same way. That, that's much more recent. Okay. And when one begins to manipulate those, those, those genomes, one can begin to examine what are the effects on the behavior of the animal. Okay. And these animals have defined behaviors, and, and, and some of these behaviors are related to, uh, to, to certain uh, uh, neurological and psychiatric disorders. In some, in sometimes they're an approximation. Sometimes they're fairly close. But um, it's uh, it, it, what's important to note is that we can use them to really to really begin to understand certain genes, and those genes to understand what the what the ramifications of either eliminating them or altering them are. Okay, and those behaviors may not be perfect, but at least they point us in the right direction. And rat, beha rat behaviors are slightly different from, mice, from mouse behaviors. Rats are slightly more sophisticated than mice. Okay, but the, the fact is that we can use them 
and we use them um, in a very sophisticated way to, to move forward. Uh, another thing that can be done with altering the genes of these animals is to introduce uh, a gene for, for that, that might be activated by light into a very specific region of, of, of the brain so that one can understand how a very, very selected set of cells respond when they're activated in a, in a, from outside the animal. And this kind of sophisticated interaction really is going to, to move forward a lot in allowing us to learn more and more. Uh, next we have uh, Drosophila, or fruit flies. Now why would, why would we move from mice to flies and what are, what are the advantages of using flies? Well, first of all, as, as many of you remember from your high school biology, a lot of the early genetics work was done with fruit flies. They, re they, they have rapid generation time, so in a couple of days you can see what, what the uh, influence of, of a cross was. But in addition to crossing them, they can be used molecularly to move around genes, knock out genes, and understand how, 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 how genes might, might, might uh, alter behavior. And yes, fruit flies do have behavior. And one can, they, they display learning, and they display avoidance behavior. And they display the, um, and, 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 and they also uh, display the kind of, of, uh, of conditioned learning that, uh, well, I guess if, if, if the name Pavlov may ring a bell, but one can uh, do that with flies as well. Okay, in addition to that, genes in, in, in Drosophila have mammalian homologs. A lot of work on circadian rhythms, understanding how how, how uh, our, daily, our, our daily rhythms uh, work was done initially in fruit flies. So that even though it's something that we experience in humans, we learned a lot from doing this in, in Drosophila. And then uh, finally, it, it's important to mention uh, primates. Now primates are not used extensively in research. Uh, they're expensive and we try to be very careful about, about using, using primates. But the fact is that they have sufficient, have the most human-like behavioral patterns. And they are really going to help us to understand the nature and neurobiology of disorders of mood and thought and, and, and other things that we really can't get that well from working with, with, uh, with mice. So what we have here is a successful approximation. One continues to use different animals until the point where we get what helps us best to understand what's going on. And that brings us to, to just a couple of comments about those who pose uh, who uh, oppose animal experiments, okay, and um, animal rights uh, well, activists are what some people would call them. I actually like the word activist, so I would prefer to call them animal extremists or animal terrorists. But what about animal rights? Okay, uh, it, it's my view that animals don't have rights, but that scientists have responsibilities. Never to unnecessarily harm an animal never to waste an animal, and to understand that when you sacrifice an animal, it truly is a sacrifice. And as a result of that, and a result of, a, of an increasing awareness on the part of scientists about the importance of acting in a humane manner, we have lots of regulations at many, many levels which are used to, to, to regulate animal research, both in terms of what we can and can't do and also the number of animals that, 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 that are used. And this must be justified extensively and justified scientifically. Okay, and so, so this is, un, it's, it's with this in mind that we're going to move to our, our next um, speaker, who is um, David, uh, oh, oh, one more thing I, I wanted to mention in terms of animals, that, uh, um, one, that uh, those, who, those who decry scientists working on animals need to remember that drugs that are developed largely as a result of animal research are used both on humans and animals. Okay, so that we are helping animals in addition directly by our research. Okay, so what I'd like to do now is introduce David Biebersdorf. And, and David is a, Dr. Biebersdorf is a neurologist uh, and an associate professor at the University of Missouri. And he is also the um, American Academy of Neurology Task Force Chair for Animals and Research. And he'll talk to us about, whereas I talked about basic research, he'll talk more about clinical research and how, how animals help in that regard. Dr. Biebersdorf. Thank you. Thank you so much for the wonderful introduction. I am a uh, clinical neurologist. I also am involved in research. Uh, but I'm going to focus on the clinical side of things because 
it is abundantly clear uh, that anything that we want to do with our patients as neurologists in the future is going to depend upon the pipeline of research coming forward. That pipeline goes directly through animals and research. We absolutely need this. And as a result of this, there's a policy that the American Academy of Neurology has put out that we are in support of this and we'll do what we can. <clears throat> And I'm the chair of the task force to begin to investigate these issues and see what we can do to help. And I, I flat out need my colleagues uh, in the neuroscience uh, society to be able to do this. And I go to the Society of Neuroscience myself to present the bit, uh, the bit of work I'm doing as well as to really know what's coming down the pike for the patients that, uh, that I have. Um, and it, it is absolutely critical. One of the things that has uh, uh, been clear to me is, is Everything has been dependent upon animals and research. It, it, we, uh, for example, uh, we in America did not have too much trouble with thalidomide back in the day because in the United States the FDA requested more animal studies. And thalidomide in other countries almost exclusively caused people to be born without limbs. Uh, this is the kind of thing that we need animals and research for and uh, uh, to be able to prevent these sorts of things. Multiple sclerosis. I'm a neurologist. I'm concerned, oh, I'm concerned a lot about multiple sclerosis. Uh, there's an animal model called experimental autoimmune encephalitis that has directly led to the immune therapies that are being out there, being used out there to treat multiple sclerosis. Uh, we now have the clot buster drugs in stroke. These could not have been developed without research in rabbits to test this out. Now you can go to the emergency room, and if you get there quickly, you can actually reverse the effects of the stroke as a result of this. Mice and other animals have led to the development of more than a dozen different new anti-epileptic drugs in the past several years. And um, this is absolutely required before we get a drug approved for F the FDA. Uh, and before any drug is used, it's tested on animals. They need to know its safety, how well it works, determine the dosage, how it's broken down, and how it's excreted. Uh, and and uh, they use two or more species, typically, to make sure that they have a final common pathway, because not every animal is identical to humans, obviously. Uh, and, they, and, and they use this before they move forward towards human clinical trials. And every drug today did go through this process. The, uh, uh, one of the areas of research I'm involved with is autism. You may ask, what, are there autistic mice? Well, no, they're not. But uh, you can knock out a gene that is abnormal in, in certain cases of autism and look at the biochemical pathway that was affected. Now, they do have behavior assays to see if you're on track that are affected as well. But you can look and see what biochemical pathway in the mouse is being impacted by this aberrant gene and in a way you could not possibly do with humans. And that could help you come up with the solutions that, uh, that, that will help these patients. Um, <coughs> excuse me. Now, one of the problems is we're up against a very, very well-funded adversary. They use uh, they use misleading efforts to promote uh, to promote their efforts. They'll take pictures of uh, of doctored pictures or uh, staged pictures in an animal lab and post it. And even if they're shown to be not true, they won't take them down. Uh, they're uh, funded an efforts uh, by misleading the public on what exactly they do. We'll hear more a little bit about that later. And they get into legal actions uh, to try to interfere with research as well. And one of the interesting ones is they, they consider uh, animal research as speciesism, just like sexism or racism. Um, it's speciesism. So we're discriminating against other species. But if you assume that uh, the animals have rights in the way we do, then you could uh, you could arrest a cat for attacking a mouse. It doesn't hold water. And they also get involved with terrorism as well. And unfortunately, the impacts of this is not only suppress the research, but it's the silence of the researchers, which is a bit of a problem. Because the kind of hiding in the sands approach is uh, resulting in a big educational problem in the public. And this is actually something I'm, I'm quite interested in, because this will actually lead to us not being able to cure diseases. Um, and it's affecting groups that you wouldn't expect it to affect. Uh, we did a recent survey looking at students that had expressed in medical school interest in neurology. So these are 
a pretty selected group, and we found <coughs> that among the students surveyed, as many as 5% in, uh, endorsed part strongly or partially that animal research should not be done. And 15% uh, said, at least partially or completely, that animal research wasn't necessary before a new surgical procedure should be approved. Uh, it was just an astounding uh, uh, finding. We did provide an educational video which altered the results significantly, but that's the problem, is that we have pretty serious issues out there with the word, even at the level of physicians. And unfortunately, that 5% uh, gone unchecked is going to be advocating against the needs of their own patients. This is a very important public interest issue, but it's also critically important that we be able to continue this line, of, uh, this type of work to be able to bring treatments to our patients. Uh, thank you very much, uh, and uh, let me pass it back to Mark. Thank you, Dr. Biebersdorf. Well, now what we're going to hear about is just what we're up against and, and what the animal extremists have done. And, and we're going to hear from Matthew Bailey, who's the vice president of the National Association for Biomedical Research. Matthew? Thank you, Mark, and thank you, everybody, for joining us today. My name is Matt Bailey. I'm vice president with the National Association for Biomedical <laughs> Research, affectionately known as NABR, or NABR. Um, NABR is a 501c6 trade association with more than 360 institutional members in the United States, each of which are conducting research with animal models in laboratories in one form or another. Uh, we've been the face of humane animal research on Capitol Hill and in the federal agencies here in Washington, D.C. for more than 33 years. Uh, you could say that we're on the front lines of uh, defending researchers' ability to continue using animal models in the face of a pretty stiff opposition. Uh, and the way we defend that use is by uh, trying to bring a little bit of common sense to public policy here in Washington and serving as the voice for both academic and corporate animal research interests. There are approximately 250 animal rights groups in the United States right now. And this is uh, a slide that shows uh, a few of their logos, some of which you may be familiar with. The Humane Society of the United States is probably fairly recognizable, as is PETA. But some lesser known organizations, such as the ALF, which stands for the Animal Liberation Front, uh, tend to engage in a, a bit more egregious activities. But about 20 of these groups explicitly state that their mission is to end the use of animals in research. And just how do they go about doing that? Well, here's the big picture. They tend to oppose research using animal models through a variety of interconnected avenues. One you may be familiar with are protests, which you see a lot with PETA. Uh, you may be less familiar with some of the illegal actions that have been committed against researchers uh, in states like California. They also attempt to uh, influence legislation and regulation here in Washington, D.C., uh, primarily because they believe if they can uh, get some bills passed or increase the regulation enough, uh, they can either prohibit or make animal research extremely difficult. Another activity they tend to engage in, they like to call undercover investigations and release exposés to the media. We don't view these as undercover investigations because these groups have no governmental authority. Uh, they tend to be nonprofit organizations like us uh, we actually call these illegal infiltrations. Uh, the types of activities that are conducted in these infiltrations tend to revolve around um, undercover video, uh, the use of button cams, keyhole cams, and manipulation of that footage to make the work seem as egregious as possible in the eyes of the public. Another way they try to uh, hamper biomedical research using animals is through the court of law. You may have seen recently that there was 
a lawsuit, or a few lawsuits actually brought in the state of New York, uh, attempting to give a chimpanzee legal personhood. Those cases were uh, thrown out, but we anticipate they'll continue to pursue those efforts. And lastly, the other way they try to uh, end the use of animals in research is through the court of public opinion, which given, you know, depending on which polls you read, uh, we may not be in such good shape on. So let's take a look at the big three animal rights organizations, kind of like the big three automakers in Detroit, uh, leading the pack in size and claimed members with 11 million members and budget as the Humane Society of the United States with about $132 million budget, $218 million in assets. 30 plus lawyers on staff Every day, they are dedicated to ending the use of animals in research. Uh, this group tends to get a lot of positive play with the public because it's often confused with local humane societies. The Humane Society of the United States is located here in Washington, D.C. It's a lobbying organization. It does not operate local humane shelters and humane societies. So I just want to clear up any confusion there. The next largest animal rights group is PETA, which everybody's heard of, founded in 1980, 34 million in revenue. They claim to have 2 million supporters. They recently opened an office here in DC, over 100 employees, and they're most known for their infiltrations of research facilities and even better known for their crazy antics in getting uh, press attention. Uh, they're less known for filing shareholder proposals or resolutions at companies. They'll buy a small amount of stock so that they can put a proposal forward at a pharmaceutical company to get them to stop using laboratory animals. Lastly, uh, the Physicians Committee for Responsible Medicine which in my opinion is a misleading name. I believe less than 5% of their members are actual MDs. Uh, it's been long rumored that the founder of this organization was in a, a romantic relationship with the founder of PETA many years ago. We do know they share a lot of information. But because of their name and their slick website, uh, they sort of pitch themselves as a healthy living organization. And they tend to get a lot of press attention and um, tend to uh, pull the wool over the public's eyes, in my opinion, as to what they're really about. But uh, make no mistake, this group also wants to end the use of animals in research. So I mentioned that they use a variety of tactics, and one of those is through media campaigns. And this is an image of a billboard that PETA bought in Madison, Wisconsin, in response to uh, an effort that they've been undertaking for over a year now uh, to basically try to drive out a research project involving uh, auditory research using cats. Uh, some of this can be fairly effective. You know, Joe the plumber driving down the street looking at this image and, and reading this message, if you call it medical research, you can get away with murder, very well might be influenced by something like this. Uh, but unfortunately, this doesn't tell the full story, does it? So for them, we've heard a picture is worth a thousand words. For them, a picture is actually worth, you know, fundraising dollars, a lot of money. Aside from media campaigns, We've seen a large number of protests and home demonstrations, unfortunately. Uh, most of this tends to occur on the coastal areas in the United States, but here are some actual images from protests. You can see that uh, one protester is wearing a mask. They often don't want to be identified, especially if they're engaged in illegal activity. And sometimes the activity uh, can be uh, encouraged online. Um, these groups often try to get uh, like-minded individuals involved in what they call activism. I think we should appropriately name it 
extremism, as was mentioned before. But here's an online tutorial for encouraging uh, something that's called hacktivism. Uh, this mini guide will teach you, if you think you still haven't paid your share of activism, how to screw a researcher's life without ever having to leave the comfort of your home. So we're seeing more and more uh, IT uh, hacks and denial of service attacks at institutions and researchers, and this is being encouraged online. Stepping up the game for a small percentage of activists are the extremists who engage in extremely illegal tactics, such as firebombing. Uh, the images on this slide are actual images, uh, some of which were obtained from the FBI, uh, of researchers' property that has was literally firebombed and communiques were released later uh, with threatening messages saying, if you don't stop what you're doing, we'll be back. Unfortunately, this does occur, but on the bright side, there is a federal law called the Animal Enterprise Terrorism Act, which Neighbor was instrumental in getting passed in Congress in 2006, that cracks down on this type of activity. Since that law was passed, we've seen fewer and fewer of these incidents. So despite the opposition, we know that we're on the right side of history. In the last century, virtually every major medical advance has involved research with an animal model. In fact, just about every Nobel Prize awarded in physiology or medicine since 1901 was somehow dependent on data from animal models. So we're on the right side of history. We have an active opposition. But the public doesn't really understand that animal research is extremely highly regulated. In fact, it's more regulated than human research. An investigator can't even touch an animal model until certain conditions have been met. The Animal Welfare Act established regulatory authority for the USDA to regulate animal research, going all the way back to 1966. This law gives USDA the authority to have its veterinary medical officers inspect facilities unannounced, sometimes up to four times a year. In addition to that, the Animal Welfare Act mandated the creation of what's called an Institutional Animal Care and Use Committee. These are diverse committees that not only include investigators and laboratory animal veterinarians, but also members of the public laypersons. In addition to regulation from USDA authorized by the Animal Welfare Act, any institution that receives NIH grant money, federal funds, must also comply with public health service policy, which uses the guide for laboratory animal care and use as its basis. If those conditions are not met for the animal's welfare, that money may either be put on hold or rescinded entirely by NIH's Office of Laboratory Animal Welfare. <coughs> Going above and beyond the regulations, uh, the vast majority of biomedical research facilities in the U.S. are ALAC accredited. ALAC is the Association for the Assessment and Accreditation of Laboratory Animal Care. It's a very rigorous process for an institution to become accredited by ALAC, even more rigorous than what the regulations have. Going beyond that, it's been my experience that talking with investigators and laboratory animal staff, there isn't a person involved in this kind of work who would like to see an animal mistreated. The fact is, that a mistreated animal is no good to science. It gives you bad results. So the bottom line is good animal welfare equals good science. A couple of guys by the name of Russell and Birch a while back came up with the concept of the three R's. Reduce, refine, replace. Everybody I've encountered in this community uh, 
takes pride in embracing the three R's. <coughs> and sometimes this concept of the three R's is used against us by animal rights groups. They say, we're not reducing enough animals. Uh, you're certainly not refining your procedures enough to use less animals. And you're not replacing them enough with non-animal models. But I just threw in this quote because I wanted to remind folks that Russell and Birch, who came up with this concept, acknowledged that we owe to animal experimentation many, if not most, of the benefits of modern medicine and countless advances in fundamental scientific knowledge. So the concept of the three R's are good, but I don't think the authors of this concept uh, would ascribe to the idea that we don't need animal research. So my last slide here, I just want to kind of close with this because I've actually got a, a, a new young daughter myself who's a little bit uh, younger than the one pictured in this photo here. And this is actually a poster that our colleague organization, the Foundation for Biomedical Research, has used for many years. It's one of our most popular posters. And she's obviously recovering in a hospital bed. She's got a couple of stuffed animals. And the slogan here is, it's the animals you don't see that really helped her recover. So this is a good reminder for why we do what we do, and this is a good reminder for why neighbors on the front lines defending scientists' ability to use animals in biomedical research, and we're happy to continue doing that. That concludes my presentation. I look forward to answering any of your questions at the end. Well, thank you, Matt, uh, both for your presentation and for your efforts on the part of, on the behalf of scientists and ultimately patients. So it is patients that we'll hear from next, and, and Dr. Uh, Thomas uh, Shipman is a uh, hematologist, oncologist who is retired, and also a Parkinson's patient and Parkinson's research advocate. And he's going to talk <coughs> of, uh, to us about the importance of using animals from the point of view of a patient. Thomas? Thank, thank you, Mark. Um, it's interesting, I was a medical oncologist, but my career both began and ended with neurologic disease. My first experience with clinical trials was in 1954, when I was in second grade. I was a polio pioneer as a result of participating in the Salk vaccine study. It would turn out to be one of the medicine's greatest achievements. Epidemic poliomyelitis, or infantile paralysis, had terrorized the nation in the first half of the 20th century. No disease was more feared. Polio had confined our president to a wheelchair. Reports of new cases resulted in public swimming pool closures or the pools were avoided by scared parents. We had movies such as The Five Pennies showing the beautiful actress Tuesday Well confined to an iron lung. Only with the use of monkeys and other animals in research did we identify polio as an infectious viral disease with multiple strains and this research ultimately led to the first vaccine. I participated in the study and actually received the vaccine and not placebo. Thanks to this research, polio has been almost totally eradicated worldwide. And most of you have no idea of what an iron lung looks like unless you see the five pennies. During my 32 years in practicing oncology, I saw a tremendous amount of progress in cancer treatment almost all of which would not have been possible without animal research. Childhood cancer went from being possibly curable to probably curable. Breast cancer, formerly a surgical disease, today has a much better prognosis with the addition of chemotherapy, hormonal therapy, and antibody therapy. The smart drug, imatinib, otherwise known as Gleevec, has tamed chronic myelogenous leukemia and gastrointestinal stromal tumors, formerly universally fatal diseases. I can go on and on in oncology. None of this could have been accomplished without animal research. In fact, therapeutic monoclonal antibodies were first made in mice and then humanized to cut down on side effects. 
Five years ago, I learned what it was like to be on the other end of the stethoscope. I was diagnosed with Parkinson's disease, also known as PD. As almost every paper written on PD states in the opening paragraph, this is a progressive degenerative disease of the nervous system. My body, my nervous system, my brain were under attack. I didn't know much about PD before, but in the last five years I've met many wonderful people whose bodies are also under similar attack. We need to call in the reinforcements. From small animals to zebrafish, from A to Z, we need all the help we can get. Although there are current treatments in Parkinson's disease brought about by animal research which palliate symptoms, so far there is nothing that changes the eventual course of the disease. For me, for my friends, for the millions suffering with PD, for their families, we need new treatments to slow, stop, and eventually reverse the progression of Parkinson's disease and other degenerative neurologic diseases. And we need it soon. This will only come about with animal studies. Wouldn't it be terrific if PD went the way of polio and one would have to go to the movies or TV reruns to see what it was like? Thank you. I'll be willing to take questions as well. Thank you, Tom. And uh, we're going to move to questions in just a moment. But what I wanted to say to those of you listening, most of you, I guess, are staffers for uh, patient advocacy organizations. And I imagine most of you are fairly young. OK, so what can you do to follow up? You can learn more by going to the uh, American Brain Coalition website There'll be a recording of this, but also there's a lot more information that you can use to, to help you in in uh, in in understanding and in and in becoming an advocate for for research. In addition to that, those of you who are in, those of you connect for, as advocates not just by talking to people uh, who are who are policymakers, but when you go to a bar, when you're sitting on a bus. Uh, Strike up a conversation. You work as a, you work for an organization that's involved in in advocating for disease. So become an advocate for for using animals for research. Just tell someone it's important. And for those of you who are in Washington, where you'll see a lot of young health staffers, you'll probably get some arguments. Well, good. You're now armed to 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 to, to compete with that and armed to deal with that. So uh, go forth, multiply, and help us. Okay, now. Let's move to the question. So the questions are being typed in, and I'm going to, to read them and direct them to, to a, a, one of the members of the house. Uh, and the first question uh, states that um, uh, you, uh, from an organization in California that uh, UCSF, University of California, San Francisco, is one of the large as a large medical research facility, and they were fined for unethical treatment of animals in their research. Uh, does neighbor act as a watchdog in overseeing human treatment of animals used for research in academic institutions? Uh, well, that that's for Matt, but I, I'm not sure that they were fine for unethical treatment of animals, and I think Matt can explain that. Well, yeah, our 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 mission is sound public policy for the humane use of animals in biomedical research. So, we don't necessarily serve as a watchdog to make sure that research institutions are engaged in humane research. But what we want is for policymakers in Washington uh, to not make laws that would make it more difficult or even prohibit the use of animal models. Uh, we agree with humane animal research. There are regulations in place for a reason. And you know, when an institution messes up, uh, if USDA comes in and finds them, um, and we look into the situation, and it's all legitimate. Then, you know that then it was probably appropriate. But there are situations where uh, government agencies can react to perceived public pressure or propaganda that's put out by animal rights groups. Uh, we like to say here in the office that a lot of these animal rights groups never let the truth stand in the way of their progress. Uh, so you could say we're a watchdog of sorts, but uh, we're more of a watchdog against uh, 
basically untruths being told by the other side on this topic. Okay, and, and, that, and, and again, remember the regulations are very complex and sometimes accidental infringement of the regulations can result in disciplinary action. The next question I have is, is for David, and that's can you describe how one specific treatment you use today was developed and how animals played a role in that? Absolutely. The, uh, the MS treatment is, is, the, is, the, is a classic example. The, uh, in in uh, multiple sclerosis, we, had, uh, we were able to actually induce a multiple sclerosis-like treatment uh, or like condition in, in an animal model uh, with this uh, autoimmune encephalitis that resembles in many ways what humans get with multiple sclerosis. And by testing this out uh, in multiple uh, multiple studies, they began to figure out how to suppress the the impact of that uh, autoimmune condition, and many of the drugs that were able to do that were able to, in turn, uh, mitigate the effects of multiple sclerosis in humans. And uh, in autism and Alzheimer's disease, the areas that I clinically work with the most, we uh, were able to find out that acetylcholine uh, it was abnormal in Alzheimer's disease, and be able to look at uh, how to elevate that in the brain selectively, and through animal models and then clinical models, be able to help with that. Now, th these conditions have a ways to go. Uh, uh, so I'm dependent upon this continuing, uh, because we are still working at uh, trying to develop things like secretase inhibitors that uh, block the deposition of plaques in Alzheimer's disease, and agents that uh, in autism are able to uh, normalize the uh, synaptic abnormalities that have been uh, discovered in autism. So uh, neurology's got a long way to go, but we've had some successes, and but we absolutely need uh, this to, get, to continue because the two conditions I treat uh, are the are are the ones that haven't had the have had the big punch yet. Uh, we've had some small ones, but we need the big ones. Okay, the, ne the next question we have, thank you, David, is uh, how do we respond to criticisms about differences in species and the relevance of that for, for uh, developing drug therapies and, and drug research? Uh, I'll take an initial stab at that, and then I'd like then then uh, open that up because we make different approaches. Uh, as I mentioned before, it's successful approximation. I remember reading a, uh, a paper years ago about using um, fluoxetine or Prozac in C. elegans, one of the examples that we had. And C. elegans is that, that little roundworm with 302 cells in its nervous system. What we were able to do is figure out exactly how that affected a certain synapse. Well, you use that, that work from the C. elegans. You might use something in fruit flies, move to mice and rats, and then ultimately to primates. And the idea is that you're refining it all along the way. So that, yes, there are species differences. And sure, species differences can, can lead to prey, but, the pro, but, but by combining lots of different data from lots of different sources, one ultimately will come close to the truth. Does anyone else want to, to answer that? I could take a little bit of a stab. I, I just, to, just from a little personal thing, when I was, uh, when I was a kid, uh, there was... They, they were talking about animals research, which is something that you know kids may or may not get exposed to these days. Um, but I said, oh, why do they have to hurt mice? And they looked at me and said, well, would you rather we test out a new drug on your grandmother? And uh, that, well, that was it. That's all I needed to hear. Uh, so bottom line, are they perfect? Uh, no. But you've got to do your best due diligence in order to try to make sure that you know what you can know in the animal models before you move to humans, and that's why they, uh, for approval, they have two different animal models they go through uh, as a requirement. Okay. So next I have what rules and regulations do scientists have to follow to use animals for research? And as someone who does it, I can answer what we have to do. One is every single protocol that we are going to use requires an application to the Animal Care Committee, and that's staffed by both uh, other scientists and veterinarians. And what has to happen is we need to justify extensively both the why we're going to use an animal, why it's a good model for what we want to do, and how many animals we're going to use. And that is that requires a statistical power analysis. This is how many animals we need. 
to get this answer. So one doesn't, can't waste animals because one has to specifically justify not only why they're going to use an animal and why it's a good model, but how many will be used. And one has to do all of that before they can begin to order an animal and start the experiments. I'll so it, add it's, a little bit to that. I mean, not only do you have to do all those things, you also have to search, and this is according to the law, whether or not there are any alternatives to animal use. Uh, and I think it's also worth noting that the Animal Care and Use Committee that you just mentioned uh, is required, again, by federal law to have somebody who's not affiliated with the institution, a layperson. Now, it can be a clergyman. It can be a member of the community. Uh, this all has to be approved by the committee before you guys can do anything with your project, correct? That's right. And and they're and they're and they're tough, but you know what? Ultimately, ultimately, we all benefit. We benefit, and the animals benefit. Okay. So uh, the next question I have is, uh, how can we balance acknowledging animal research um, as an advocate, as an advocate, uh, with the pressure that we receive from uh, animal extremists? And that's for Matt. Well, you know, I think part of the reason we're experiencing the problem we are right now, which is, um, generally speaking, a lower public approval rating than we've had in a long time. Our, our national polling has suggested uh, we've dipped as low as 55% approval. But a lot of that can depend on how you're asking the question. Uh, the, Part of the reason we're in that situation is, it's just to be frank with you, because of fear. And you know, I contend that there's really not anything to be afraid of. Yes, there have been a few incidents where people have had some threats. They've had people show up at their homes. But these are relatively isolated incidents when you look at the big picture. And because of the Animal Enterprise Terrorism Act, it's we've seen a steep decline. Um, a part of it is lack of education. Uh, I think somebody mentioned a few minutes ago that they didn't know whether school children were exposed to this kind of thing anymore, which is entirely possible. And in many cases, they probably aren't. The bottom line is, if we don't start talking about it and putting our fear aside, uh, we could potentially lose this battle, and that's going to be bad for everybody, all of our society. Uh, we won't be able to advance uh, medical treatments and breakthroughs if we can no longer use animal models. And in order to change the public perception, we've got to just start acknowledging it, talking about it, letting people know about the regulations, owning the animal welfare aspect of it. I talk to people in this community every day, and I'm always amazed at how much they actually care about the animal's welfare. It's, it's not the picture that's painted by the other side. So we have a public perception problem. I think we can fix it. We just have to put our fear aside. If I can, yeah. I, I suspect. I sus this is David, uh, D uh, David Overstorff. I suspect that for what it's worth, the uh, people that would be donating uh, for uh, the research, private foundation research groups are not the same people that are animal activists. I don't think there's much of any overlap in those two groups. Uh, so that, that, if, that, if that's part of the question in mind, I doubt that's a major issue. On the other hand, as it was mentioned before, children are exposed to the idea, almost a given, that animal research is a bad thing because their young teachers have been have, have that mindset, as do young health staffers. You know, this right. is a real problem that we have we have lost the public relations battle. And it's 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 organizations like Neighbor that uh, that are trying to bring it back, but it's also incredibly important that scientists and clinicians Make sure to advocate for medical research whenever they have a chance, okay? Because if we don't do it, nobody else is going to. When we go to the, even to the grade schools to talk to kids, talk about the importance of doing animal research and let them see that you're not a monster, even if you are. 
<laughs> My point was that I don't think we'd lose donations by saying that. Oh, got it. Okay, okay. Right. But no, but I'm saying that we need to advocate, and we need to make it clear that if if <clears throat> that that it's important that we do this, and we can't give up. Okay. Well, I don't uh, see any more questions here, and. Um, Maybe someone can correct me if I'm wrong, but if that was the last question, then I'd like to, to uh, uh, Robin Elliott to make some concluding remarks. Robin? Uh, thank you, Dr. Rasnick, and, and thanks to all of our speakers. That was a terrific uh, seminar, and I personally learned a lot. I'm sure my other colleagues among the uh, nonprofit uh, advocacy organizations feel the same way. Dr. Rasnick, Dr. Bebersdorf, Mr. Bailey, and Dr. Shifton, Thank you for treating us to a very scholarly and a very pertinent uh, 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 series of arguments. Um, I'd like to encourage um, all of you who participated in this uh, webinar today to think about how you can uh, apply some of this to your own educational work. Um, so the uh, incorporation onto your website, very obvious, and the, the mode that most of us use these days to reach our various publics, acknowledging the role of animal research consider uh, adopting policies in this direction and uh, you'll find ready resources and help if you wish to have that through the American Brain Coalition, Katie Sale, our executive director, and of course the Society for Neuroscience that uh, put this program together today. We very much appreciate their leadership in this whole, uh, on this whole issue and many other issues of importance to medical research. Uh, please, if you have other questions, uh, do visit the American Brain Coalition website. It's, uh, I think the uh, domain name is up there on your screen, www.americanbraincoalition, one word, .org, for information on how you can incorporate information on animal research and also other policy issues affecting uh, neuroscience and uh, brain research in general. Uh, please do, and you can also find out on the ABC website other programs that we offer uh, in the educational area and in the policy area. Please take advantage of this and please contact us. Uh, my name is Robin Elliott at the Parkinson's Disease Foundation, but more important, our director who is uh, there for full time, uh, Katie Sale, who will be delighted to uh, give you, uh, both give you information on what we do and what we offer, but also take suggestions if you have them. We very much believe in uh, crowdsourcing our community for uh, information and initiatives. So once again, thank you very much to our four terrific speakers. Thank you to the Society for Neuroscience for putting this whole thing together. And to all of you, um, a good okay. balance of the winter, a warmer right. one that we're having in our part of the country. And um, hope to be in touch with you in a, in a near future. Thanks a lot. Bye-bye.